welcome everybody to Hope for Our Times. And hey, I know we started an hour later than normal, but that's okay because we're still starting and uh, we should be back on track next time. But uh, right now, uh, as usual, this is the, I guess it's the, like the Tom and the Tom and John program or something. Is that right, John? <laughs> I guess that's right. And yeah, by the way, next week we'll still be at 2 p.m. because I'm, uh, oh, I'm okay. semi-retired. I'm an old guy, and I have a job working at a golf course, so I get free golf. So that I don't get home until 1:30. You know what? So. I, uh, um, I, I don't golf. I, I golf, just not very good. I'm not. I'm not a good golfer. I'm unimpressive. Like I usually can I. Can I yeah, go ahead. Should I tell you? I don't know if I've ever told you my golf story with Zola Levitt. Do you remember Zola? Uh, I do remember Zola Levitt, yeah. Okay, well, we were playing out at the Oak Quarry in Riverside. And, yeah, and I know he, where that he is. loved golf. He, he wasn't really that great, but he loved golf. But he hated bunkers. He hated being in the sand. I don't blame him. So we're playing out there one day. So we're he's in a bunker on every hole. So we get to the seventh hole, he's in a bunker. We get to the eighth hole, and he's in a he's in a fairway bunker and then there's a little tiny pop bunker by the green and he's in it again i mean is this is the smallest bunker on the golf course and he's in it and i walked up to him and i said so you know i love you man but i haven't had you on the clock today but i'm pretty sure you've now spent more time in the sand than your forefathers did getting from <laughs> egypt to the promised land <laughs> <laughs> that's so. pretty funny uh, that's that's funny i usually shoot, he thought it was funny uh, when i when i golf i usually shoot around an 80. And then okay, when I start well, I, the, when I start the second nine, then it's usually yeah. about another eighty. Yeah. So I shot I shot a sixty one day, and it's like, oh, when did you stop? You know, I stopped. <laughs> you must have stopped early. If you really did play eighteen, and you shot a sixty. That's impressive on any. No, point. no. I I have shot in the sixties for eighteen before, but it's a rare occurrence. It's, I did it's that. Sort of like, I, I was on a miniature golf course, and I did something like that one time. So it was it was really impressive. All right, it's sort of like finding a Facebook like a prophecy book that doesn't uh, come to dogmatic conclusions. <laughs> it's pretty rare. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Hey, so we have we have much to talk about today, and we're going to take questions. So everybody, get ready to send in your questions. We're just going to kick it off. Uh, John lives in the path of totality with the upcoming eclipse. I have my own opinion on the eclipse, but hey, that's me. But Let's just get rolling with some AI things, John, because you have uh, a, another roundtable coming up next week that's going to be outstanding. Uh, in fact, um, uh, six p it's six p.m. Eastern, three p.m. Pacific. It'll be uh, Bridgelat, Scott Townsend, you if you're able to make it. I know you have some scheduling issues. Me and uh, Patrick Wood. Patrick Woods, what a, what an asset, man. What a great panel that's going to be. All right, so let's get this started. And again, everybody, feel free to please send in your questions. Put the word question in all caps. But so, so OpenAI and Microsoft reportedly are planning a $100 billion data center project for an AI supercomputer. Uh, John, what do you have to say about that? Because you are in Ohio. You have... A massive data center there too. Well, they're all over town. I mean, Amazon has them all over town. But then out in New Albany, they have a big Amazon warehouse. They're building a huge warehouse. The one that's there is the biggest trucking warehouse I've ever seen. And I, you know, I have family that lives around Ontario, California, which is the town of uh, trucking warehouses. Yeah. But um, then Facebook has six buildings. Uh, they're each, as long as the Empire State Building is tall, Google has spent about $6 billion building server farm out there. Uh, and most of it's cooling towers because the things run. And these buildings are just full of racks of computers and servers and and everything. And it's, it's crazy. Somebody said, a friend of mine sent me a nice little ditty about Ohio server farms that says... Uh, uh, old McDonald had a server farm, AI, AI, O <laughs> for OH. Yeah, I get it. For get Ohio, it. AI, AI, O. So that, I thought that was pretty clever. So I don't know where they're building this thing. I know Bill Gates has bought about 50,000 acres of farmland west of downtown Columbus. and But he's going to take about 4,500 acres of it and build the largest single solar array in the country there. 
How many 4,500 acres? acres, 4,500 acres. So the word is he's going to spend a billion dollars to build this. A billion dollars. To build wow. solar. Who's doing this? And I'm like, you know, there's a prison out there, but it's farmland. I don't know what he's, you know, I'm sure he's going to pump the electricity someplace, but this is very weird. And I don't know if you saw the, the hailstorm down in Texas that they had recently. Yeah. By the way, we've had two of the worst hailstorms I've ever been in in my life in the last 10 days. So I, here so where we I, did. I, I want to ask you about that because uh, a friend of mine who, who has asked to remain anonymous lives down in Texas and uh, he put a new roof on his house because of the hailstorm. And then I think it was a week ago, another hailstorm came. He showed me the pictures. He said it completely destroyed the roof he only had for three weeks. And then we we're in Indiana last week at Calvary right. Chapel Lafayette with Joe Bell. And I can't remember where we were driving, but there was a massive like solar farm. And I'm I, right. I don't it's somewhere out there. I don't know where it was. And I'm looking, going, okay, it's cloudy, it's cold, it rains, it hails. And the only thing I could think about is these massive hailstorms hitting the solar panels, and plus you need a lot of sun. So I'm trying to figure out there's something, there just seems to be something rather fishy with this to me. The whole thing is there's a guy to follow. His name is Dave Walsh, Dave Walsh Energy on Getter. And he's on Bannon's War Room a lot. But he says, this is the destruction of our electricity grid, yet these guys are coming in with these big server farms that need a lot of electricity. So here in Ohio, we have so many of these data centers now that public officials, utility officials are saying, we don't know if we have enough capacity in the grid to continue to build these things because we've shut down all of our coal plants. Yeah. And solar really, solar and wind really only give you at best with battery backup, you know, where you make the battery, recharge the batteries, you're talking maybe five hours of power a day. Then they put in all these regulations about electric vehicles and it's insane because these electric vehicles are supposed to be plugged in at night when the solar doesn't operate. Yeah. It's a, it, so there's it, something fishy going on with this. It's thing. like they're trying, you know, you know, I'm a little, I've always been a little skeptical that they want to reduce the population that much, but then you look at what they're doing and it seems like they really don't really care if we're around. And with the AI development and everything, it does seem like there's a, it, it's almost like a war in humanity. So I know we'll talk about that next week with the, uh, the round table on technology and AI, but I, it, you know, it, it's hard for me to make sense of it. So, I mean, so like here's Bill Gates, he buys all this farmland. And then, by the way, Tom, this is some of the best farmland in the world. And he's going to cover over 4,500 acres, about 10% of what he bought with a with solar panels. Well, the rest of it, he's, he's growing bugs on. So he can make bug burgers. I have no idea what, I mean, that guy is, uh, you know, I, I would be... Uh, gracious, it, would, it takes all my grace in me to say that he's a bit strange and a bit off. That's uh, I, yeah, just a little bit. Um, he he's an evil guy. I mean, he really is. He so he's, he's totally evil. He's an evil person. Uh, by the way, so, this particular uh, place. Yeah, where are they this, building this big server farm for hundred billion? Yeah, it's in. Uh, I have it here. New Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin. So, okay, I'm sure it's dairy farm country. Oh, uh, I would think so. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. <laughs> I, well, you know, getting rid of the dairy farms. Getting rid of, gotta get know, rid of all the cows. Their gas is uh, making the atmosphere yeah. worse. Yeah. Just that, no, I mean, when I grew up, CO2 was, CO2 was like what plants ate. It was good to have CO2 because the plants would be happy. Yeah. Uh, ex now ex it's a exactly. Notice how China isn't going for these stupid things, they're building more coal plants. They're building one, they're opening one or two a week. Yeah, because they, they- A they, whole plant. Yeah, that's, yeah. So you look at what we're doing here and you think, all right, very interesting. So here's another one for you, John. Governor Newsom applauds rollout of AI surveillance network in California. Uh, that's no surprise, you know. 
um, to anybody in California. It's not a surprise. But uh, it, this is from Zero Hedge. If you're not a criminal, then you have nothing to hide, right? This is the perpetual argument used in favor of state mass surveillance throughout history. It's the underlying justification at the birth of every surveillance agency from the Soviet Cheka to the German Stasi and beyond. Don't commit crimes and you have nothing to worry about. Isn't that, that is what we're told. Hey, if, if you just do what you're supposed to do, you don't have to worry about being surveilled. Well, well, let me, let me just say this. This, this is, Gavin Newsom is an evil guy. And I don't believe anything he says. There is a very, and, and so look, I did some white collar criminal work in my career. So I, I understand the system a little bit. I understand law. And you know, when I started, I, I remember the section library that had the federal register that had all the federal regulations in it. Now it's like shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf. It wasn't that huge of a section. So there's all these things that you can violate. There's all these code sections. And I'll just say this, like, I know people don't like Trump and, and that type of thing, but Trump went and applied for loans. The banks gave him a loan and years after the fact, after the loans were paid off, and the bank said they wanted to do more business with Trump. They came in and they charged him under this New York statute that was designed to prevent people from, I don't know, making fraudulent sales of refrigerators or something. And now he's, you know, they're trying to bankrupt him. Yeah. There was a book written years ago called One Felony a Day, I think it was called. And the guy said that there's so much federal regulation and statutes that it's virtually impossible for anybody not to commit a federal crime anymore. Mm. And so when Gavin Newsom says, says that he's either totally ignorant or he's an evil tyrant liar. And I'm going to stick with the latter. Yeah. He's an evil tyrant liar. However, this is weird. He seemed to be rather ignorant on some of the laws in California where, you know, was it you can steal $900 worth of stuff from a store and they got to let you go? You know about that, right? Is, or it might even right. be a thousand, whatever it is. So he goes into a Target somewhere in Northern California, up where he lives, goes into a Target and he's shocked. I mean, I wonder what he's doing at a Target, first of all, him. But he goes into a Target, he's shocked because some thief is in there and he challenges the worker, aren't you gonna do anything? Did you see that? And the worker no. said, it's your laws. And he seems stunned. What do you mean, my laws? We can't do anything because of you. So I think it's both. I think he's an ignorant person and he's a total evil, despot, wicked, demon-possessed man. Is, is he related to Nancy Pelosi? Yeah, he's a, is he, a nephew, right? A nephew? So, I if you, if, John, you probably have done this. Have you ever traced back the Pelosi family? They, it's the mob. Her, her California. dad was a, a mob related uh, mayor of totally. Baltimore, Maryland. So, speaking okay. of Baltimore. Oh, I, and if you look back at it in California, <laughs> when you look at the early time of California politics, when you started getting her background, her family involved in it, it was mob. The whole thing was run by the mob, California. This goes back so probably she went in, about eight she, years. She went into politics, which the mob. is part of the mob family that's, business. That's e exactly right, right? I mean, Vegas right. turned out one way and California turned out another way. But that's that's California politics. We had a, we had Reagan for a while, which was kind of nice. But, you know, so anyways, enough of that. People are, <laughs> so we, we can go on about this nonsense forever. So Jeanette Damphouse <laughs> asks this question has nothing to okay. do with what we've talked about so far. Good. For believers that believe in replacement theology, are they in a scary situation? Meaning, what does our Heavenly Father think of them? Well, you know, we can speculate on what God thinks, but I, I think biblically, those who believe in replacement theology, um, I mean, I know what my thoughts are. Our salvation is based on who Jesus Christ is, not replacement theology, but what are your thoughts? Well, and the cross, I mean, that's kind of central. So that's why, you know, sometimes in eschatology, we fight and argue over different things. It's only when people start to delve off into another gospel or when people talk about gifts of the spirit and everything. And 
the problem is sometimes people they delve off into another gospel. They 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 want to add stuff to the gospel, which renders the gospel ineffective. It makes it not the gospel. Listen, I think replacement theology though is I think the the gospel, Tom, to me is much more it, it's much more comprehensive. It has different aspects to it. So, for example, when Paul says in Ephesians chapter six to put on the whole armor of God, and he starts, you know, the the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. And then he gets down to this last one, which is your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And this is where some people are going to get really mad with me. An aspect of the gospel is, is there's the work that Jesus did. It was full, complete, finished. But there's more coming. And so when you unpack, go to Isaiah 46 or 48, and you unpack this feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, what you find is that this is a gospel about, it, it, or it's it's a it's an aspect of the gospel about the coming kingdom. And so I think that's one area, like this, these are just my personal thoughts, that this replacement theology is really bad because it does undermine that aspect of the gospel about the coming kingdom. And so I think that, uh, I think one of the sayings that I've heard is that if if you're wrong on Israel, it doesn't mean you're not saved or anything like that. But it usually means you're wrong on something else too. Uh, you know, your your error doesn't usually just stop with that particular error. So I think that, uh, and so then you'll see. I was just watching some videos of Andy Stanley this morning talking about you know we really need to get away to get the the. The early church, the early guys in the church, they didn't have, they didn't have the Bible. They didn't have a Bible or anything like that. So why don't we just talk about what they witnessed? And it's like, we only know what they witnessed because we have the Bible, because <laughs> none of them are around right now, at least that we can talk to. That's Andy and, Stanley. <laughs> and in, in Acts 17, you know, the Bereans were the most noble because when they met with the apostles, they went back to scripture to see whether what they were saying was true. So there was scripture around. Mm -hmm. the, I think it's a mis, this is just sort of a pet peeve of mine. We think of these disciples that Jesus had as these sort of unschooled, ignorant fishermen. And I, I disagree with that. They were schooled in the scriptures and before they met Jesus, they understood the scriptures. So I, I think we, I think we diminish them how, how well versed in scripture they were before Jesus came along. So they would, I, I would look at it like this: they weren't schooled in the sense that of the Jews in Jerusalem were, which was different. However, it's very evident from conversations and the writings they had to have a very sufficient working knowledge of the Old Testament. You, you, uh, uh, you look at Matthew, just one example. You know, when right. you look at his writings, Matthew the tax collector, um, John, they, there was an understanding that they did have that was quite deep. It wasn't at the same understanding of the Jews in Jerusalem, however, but they weren't ignorant of the scriptures at all, no matter what Andy Stanley seems to think. In John 1, where Jesus, uh, I think it's Nathaniel, says, you know, Nathaniel, before, I don't know, I saw you in the garden. Yeah. Remember? Yeah, right. That man, I saw you from the foundation of, before the foundation of the world, I knew you. That was a, that was a statement as to the Messiah as the, Messiah is the creator of everything. And then, and then Nathaniel, I think it's Nathaniel goes, he says, man, you come see this guy who told me everything I ever was or knew or everything about me. And the statement is in, in that passage of John 1, Jesus says, you, you think that's amazing? You'll see, what do you see? You'll see angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. Yeah. And, then, and that's, you were just at Bethel. Talk. Yeah, that takes back to Jacob's ladder. 
I yeah. am Jacob's ladder is what Jesus was saying there. Yeah. And so, and those guys, those fishermen in Galilee would have, they knew what he was talking about. Absolutely. They, they went to the synagogue on Saturdays. They celebrated the Shabbat. They celebrated the feast days. We, they went to Jerusalem. They had a very good working knowledge of what the Old Testament was. Uh, so back to uh, replacement theology. My, listen, we aren't saved by, it. we're saved because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And I see replacement theology like you do. I, I believe it's very problematic because if you don't trust God's covenant with Abraham, that's an everlasting covenant, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to your descendants forever. And then if you work that out to the point, well, if you can't trust God for his covenant with Israel, how can you trust God for any covenant he has made? God is a promise maker and he's a promise keeper. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, where God says, I will bring you back into the land because of my name. You, you profane my name everywhere you went, but I'm bringing you back because my name's on the covenant. Listen, if grace applies to me, listen, I've profaned the name of the Lord, yet he saved me because of the covenant with the son. So how does, we're saying that doesn't apply to the Jew? So replacement theology is saying, it literally is saying that. This doesn't apply to, everybody can have grace <laughs> except for the Jews. And uh, I mean, we could work it out even further. I, um, because it is problematic in what else do you not believe in the Bible? Because you can't take that literally. Right. That means you can't really take the prophecies of the second coming of Christ literally, which is what you already said. Um, you know, the, the, Jesus is coming back. He came the first time, he's coming again. So I, I've men I think I've mentioned this with you before because I think it was a very profound moment and it occurred at this most recent pre-trib study group conference. It was the last panel and I know people are going to say, well, John, you're not pre-trib. Why are you watching the pre-trib study group conference? It's because I, maybe it's my law training. I want to know what everybody's thinking so I can respond yeah, no, to both it. sides. But, so, your... but it was, it was the last panel was Randy, Randall Price, J.B. Hickson, Arnold Fruchtebaum, and I can't remember the guy's name. He was a prof from Liberty. And somebody got up and essentially asked the question. I'm probably asking it in a little bit more pejorative way than they asked. It was like, why should we love the Jews? Why should we give them any quarter? Because they they hate the gospel. And I was in a discussion yesterday with somebody that works at MacArthur's church on Twitter. And he's going, all oh, these Jews, you know, they they treat us bad. They they spit on people. They spit on Christians. They reject the gospel. Why should why should we even care? And this Liberty professor gave one of the best answers I think I've ever heard for this for this discussion was, listen. We need to exercise, go first, go, go read Romans 9, 10, and 11, hmm. and exercise the grace towards unbelieving Israel that was exercised by someone towards you when you rejected the gospel and were in the same position. And I thought that was a yeah. very intelligent, that was, like, that, that was like a sledgehammer on that argument, Amen. in my opinion. I thought it was fantastic. So I, I want to recognize him. You can find it on the website, the YouTube channel. Uh, it's in that it's in that last panel. That's really good. Hey, by the way, everybody, Kurt Reed's going to be joining me today live, 2 o'clock Pacific time, if you can uh, jump in. And uh, it's going to be a great uh, program with Kurt today. And then, uh, so Pookie Martinez asks this question. Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. How shall Antichrist subdue the three kings? Of course, that's the passage where it says there's going to be ten horns, and then the eleventh horn will come up after them, and then uh, we know three are going to be subdued. John, do you have any idea how these three will be subdued? Because I don't know how they're going to be subdued. <laughs> you know, um, it, it could be through a combination of factors. Uh, it could be militarily. Um, I, I, I honestly, I don't know exactly how it's sort of like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll recognize it when it happens, if I'm still alive or around or whatever. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to happen, but you know, Tom, things change very, very quickly in this world that we're in right now. 
And I think that the speed of change are going to happen. So for like this, this week, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, who's been at the top of that country for pretty close to 25 years, they had a lot of elections that went against him. Now, I heard some Israeli politicians say, oh, well, that's great. They, you know, he's been against Israel. But I think that part of the reason he lost so big was because he wasn't uh, against Israel enough wow. in that they were still supplying goods to Israel, things from oil pipelines, they, that stuff is still being transported to Israel, goods, services, that type of thing, because a lot of people in Turkey want them cut off completely. So I, I, I'm not sure Erdogan's dead yet in terms of politically dead. Mm. A lot of people have said, you know, years ago he was dead and then he had a big victory just last year. And now all of a sudden it's, it's, uh, he, the local elections really went against him. So I don't know if he's going to run again, but I don't think that the new guy is any better. And of course, I don't know if you saw this, they had a big political celebration. I think the deputy director of the opposition party that did so well, they were standing on a balcony and the balcony collapsed and the guy was killed. That happened last night or the day before in Ankara. So I don't know things change very, very quickly yeah. these days. So I don't know how these three are going to be overcome. They may be overcome by craftiness, mm -hmm. by sweet words, by diplomacy, or it could be brute force. Well, we know with antichrist, it will be sweet words, diplomacy, uh, and so forth. And then proof force, all of the above will come into it. Then the hammer will be dropped. Then the That's hammer right. will drop. By the way, on Monday, this coming Monday on April 8th, you know, the day of the, the eclipse, Bishop Alan Didio is going to be joining me for the first time from Encounter today. Looking really forward to that. Uh, it's going to be great. I, I have a question about Al Jazeera and Israel in just a minute, but I got to get to Joe Mama's question first. So Joe Mama, Joe Mama, you ready? <laughs> Joe, Joe Mama, there, John, says, um, asks, Jacob saw the heavens open and angels ascending and descending. Was this a portal? It was a vision he had. But, uh, I, I think it was a vision. I don't know if it was a yeah. portal. I mean, I, everybody's talking about portals because would, CERN is supposed to start up again next week. On the 8th? During the eclipse, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I live in the path of totality, so I'll be... Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'll be I'll be fried or something sucked like down, that. Sucked I guess. Up, I've got my little I got my little eclipse glasses and yeah, all this stuff. So I they, by the way, they changed the path of totality. Did you know that? No, you know I why? I did not know that because nobody knew the diameter of the sun. Oh, that's funny. So somebody had to figure out the diameter of the sun, so they issued a new map. So it changed it like by two or 300 yards. So if you're on the Southern, like you're on the edge of the eclipse, you might be outside the path of totality because the path of totality, they're pretty sure changed by uh, a, a few hundred yards on each side. Very interesting. <laughs> it is like, wait a minute, you guys didn't, nobody thought to measure that, you know? I guess it's sort of like, I guess you didn't think you needed to put that bolt in the window on the on the 737 or something. <laughs> DEI. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> DEI in the, in the science world, too. So Amory Duffy asked this question. We're actually going to come back to this, but it's intriguing because I think a lot of people have this question when they look at Bible prophecy. But I want to come back to this one after we go to Al Jazeera. But this is... This is going to be your question, so think about it. You're a lawyer. You can, okay. It's easy for you to think of two things at the same time. Why do people teach that Antichrist will confirm a peace covenant? I don't see the word peace in that fits in that scripture. Okay, so we're going to come back to that. But let's go to Al Jazeera first. Uh, uh, so uh, Al Jazeera has been kicked out of uh, Israel for the most part by Knesset. I don't know what the where it lies right now as of today. But I know as of the other day, the U.S. is saying that better not happen. I mean, you, you get the U.S. government saying, how, could, how dare you kick out Al Jazeera? I think all of the ladies on The View <laughs> are upset about it. So the government that wants to censor all of us that disagree with them is concerned that Al Jazeera is getting booted out of Israel. Yeah. Is that, I, yeah. And, and I think the women in The View and, 
and probably the governor of New York, and you know, you look at this. I mean, I just think, wow. So you can't decide that in Israel. I mean, it's just well, amazing. I, and by the way, why did it take them so long to make this determination? We're six months no into kidding. this war, just about. No kidding. And by the way, you remember the 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 young lady that they would taken most of her clothes off. Yes, on the truck. Broken leg on the truck. Yes. The person who took those pictures won a journalism award. Yeah. Won a won an award for taking the picture. For the photograph, what wasn't that what it was? Yeah, they should find him and arrest him. Yeah, I mean that's just because they were they were part, these guys were participating in this thing. It's unbelievable know? that you would win an award for that. And that's this shows how far gone this world really is. Right, and if you stand up against something like the transgender day of visibility. On you're the problem on Easter. Yeah, I mean, if you did that at, a, at the, like the New York Times, you stood against that, you'd yeah. be fired. Yeah, I mean, Barry Weiss, she's no conservative. She pretty much got the boot from the New York Times because she took a position that didn't uh, square with the left wing orthodoxy at that institution. So I got a, a story for uh, you can't make this up on Thursday. Um, What's the name? Jenner, right? Used to be Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn, Caitlyn Jenner. Jenner. Did you well, see what yeah. Caitlyn Jenner said? I mean, this is, it's really, an, uh, you look at it, you go, this is pretty wild. So Caitlyn Jenner says how offensive it is that the Biden administration would mark uh, the transgender day on Easter Sunday when it's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did you see that? I saw that. That is a total <laughs> flip. You, you can't make this up. You, you can't make this up. So that's <laughs> one of my stories coming this Thursday. But I mean, I look at that. That to me is like, wow. How how does that happen from the one of the lead? What was one of the big promoters of transgenderism saying? No, this is about the resurrection of Jesus. That's right. re to me, it's remarkable. But nevertheless, right. okay. So uh, Miss V says hello. Uh, greetings from India. God bless you both for this episode. Hello, Miss V. I <laughs> no, no, I shouldn't do that because somebody else yeah. so freeze Am that picture. Uh, okay, Anne Marie Duffy. Why do people teach that Antichrist will confirm a peace covenant? I don't see the word peace in that scripture. Why do you I, think it is? She's correct that there's no peace there. And so that's I think part of it comes from um, how do I say this? All these Bible prophecies will be fulfilled in a real world. So when we look at the real world right now, Israel's at war with its at least some of its neighbors. And it's pretty serious. I mean, it, it's heating up. In fact, I, tomorrow morning I'm going to interview, it'll probably be up around noon tomorrow, uh, Avraham Levine, who's one of the people at Alma Research in the north. He lives in the Golan about a mile. He lives about 30 miles from Damascus. And he's expert on the North. He's been in Gaza. He's been in the IDF reserve. He served in Gaza. And I did an interview with him two weeks ago. It was, I think it was one of the more important interviews I've ever done. So you want to look that up on our YouTube channel. I'll interview him tomorrow. But we, we're, everybody's at war. There's this war going on. So people think like, well, how does this get resolved so the Jews can build their temples? So the red heifer thing can happen. And how, how, how do we get to this place? And, and so a lot of people take these prophecies and say, well, this must be in some kind of peace treaty or covenant. Now, I'm not sure that that's what it means, because I think we've talked about this, that it, it may be in the sense that this is shoved down their throats. We saw this last week, mm -hmm. again, with the U.S. on, you know, you have to do a uh, ceasefire with, with Hamas. That's, that's what the world is telling Israel right now. And there's nobody, there's nobody else in the world standing up to it at all. You know, in, in, in Israel, there were some people tragically killed that were uh, working with the UN. And so the, the Israeli ambassador summoned to the, prime, the foreign ministry or prime minister's office in the UK this morning over that particular incident. 
and I, I watched the charade at the UN last week on the resolution 2827 to make Israel do a, a ceasefire. And there's a representative there, and he's got a little tag in front of him that says the state of Palestine, which doesn't exist. Yeah, never has. What a, what a fake charade. So in that context of what people are doing is they're looking at the scripture, I think, and they're trying to figure out, it's, I guess you would call it righteous speculation. They're trying to figure out, okay, how does this work out? Mm -hmm. And we know that when Jesus came, Jesus instituted the new covenant, right? And that we can partake in. But, and so I think part of what's happening here is that Satan's faking this. Okay, this this is a, like there's an antichrist, a pseudo-Christ, there's a fake covenant. And so we, we try to, and so sometimes it just gets kind of thrown around by a lot of people as, confirms a peace covenant. And then that almost becomes like part of the canon of scripture, even though that's not exactly what it says. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, uh, I agree. The, there's different passages that I think are used and have been used. So it does kind of become like, almost like canon when it's not. Uh, so there's a covenant with many. We know that. We know from Isaiah chapter 28, uh, there's a covenant that's entered oh, in order help. to avoid the scourge that's coming there. So there's certain things that allude to, hey, there's something that Israel's going to enter into to avoid a problem, right? And then you have, mm -hmm. I think it's Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. I'm not sure on that scripture, everybody, but I think that's where it is, where Antichrist, uh, he he gains power through, pe through peace and or prosperity. Uh, we know from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there's peace and security or peace and safety. Ezekiel 38, we have uh, peace and safety um, before that. Now, Ezekiel 38, I don't believe it's the same as the covenant of Daniel chapter 9, but still we have this, this, uh, this theme that's carried out with the nation of Israel as we look at the last days. Um, and I think a lot of it, John, um, this would be something you would you would probably agree with being pre-wrath, is that a lot of it is in the pre-trib, which I am pre-tribulation rapture. Um, a lot of it is when you have the white horse, the white horse appears to bring in some type of pseudo peace, a, a conquering peace. It may be forced <laughs> because you get to the red horse, the, sec the white horse being the first one, second horse is red horse, peace is taken from the earth. So therefore... You have a combination of these things, but John, I want to say this: when you look at the white horse, and you know, you brought this up, a peace in, or, or, or a an agreement imposed upon Israel. You brought this up with me a, a, at least a month ago, I think maybe even two months ago on this program. And when you look at it with the white horse, it goes about conquering and to conquer. That's an implication of a forced something that's imposed upon the globe and obviously right. Israel's the center. But uh, when you first brought this up, not connecting with the white horse, but still brought it up about this, this imposed agreement that covenant upon Israel, it makes sense because Europe has been saying, we're going to have to impose this. And I remember you mm -hmm. bringing it up and all these articles are coming out and we even see it now with Gaza. What's Israel going to do? We're going to have to make Israel enter into this. Yet, in Isaiah 28, you do have leaders of Jerusalem that appear to be in agreement with it, but they're, are they in agreement? They, they know it's a bad deal. You can tell that from reading Isaiah 28, but they still go along with it. So I think that's a good question, and I think sometimes it's just automatically it's a peace covenant. I think peace right, just is part of it. I asked Bill Salas this question. Bill, what all do you think is involved in that covenant that's confirmed? And he 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 has you know Bill really thinks through stuff, and uh, he he, has, he, had, he had a lot of different things in there that I never thought of before. I don't know if he's hundred percent right, but he might be because he really thinks through those things well. Well, I played golf with Bill Salas many times, and you know we're we're on the fifteenth hole before we even start talking about golf 
start. You know, we're arguing about. We're not arguing. We're talking about Bible prophecy. Who so. wins? Uh, you know, uh, well, you know, it depends on who you ask. Uh, <laughs> there's no scorecard in that, oh, okay. in that little back and right. forth. But, you know, look, that came up because of the, the way these resolutions go. And the resolution on the settlements at the end of the Obama administration in 2016 with Samantha Power, you know, I was looking at the word Gavar, Gavar, whatever you say that in Hebrew in uh, Daniel 9. 27 and it's like it sort of has this implication with it's something that comes forcefully with force is one of the ways that that could be interpreted and by the way tom these bible passages are very these are complicated things to unpack so I, i'm not trying to get people to question everything they've ever been taught but for example you mentioned the antichrist of daniel 8 it does say it is 28 25 or 26 he says through peace, he will destroy many, I think is the way yes, that's it. the King yeah. James interprets it. But if you go to the Legacy Standard Bible or the NASB or the ESV, I'm looking at it here and it says, he'll magnify himself in his heart and he will destroy many while they are at ease. Mm. So that doesn't, so again, it's a matter of interpretation a little bit. And so I don't, I really think that sometimes these scriptures, that deal with things in the future, they they aren't facts yet. You know, I'm a lawyer. I always dealt with facts. Those were things that had happened in the past, things that people had said, things that people had written, and things that people had done. But when you're talking about the future thing, I think we make a mistake if we uh, plan a flag that it has to happen this way. Yeah. Because we're, I mean, really, the last four years should teach us that things don't always go the way. Yeah, go. yeah, exactly. <laughs> no kidding. And by the way, uh, so, you know, we just went through April 1st. And so now we've had three months and I'm pretty sure every day of the last three months, people have looked at what's going on in the world. If they're paying attention and thought, I really would like to go back to the good old days of 2023. Yeah, and things are, I think things are going to get a lot more wild here, which will lead us to our next question about EMPs in a second. But uh, there's okay. also another one of the versions John says uh, in Daniel chapter 8, uh, will destroy many in prosperity, through, through prosperity. Mm -hmm. So you look at right. this and you start thinking, what are they promising with Gaza? Well, we're going to bring ease, we're going to bring prosperity, and we're going to impose this upon you. And I mean, you, it's just interesting, but ultimately this does focus on Jerusalem. And I think we would all agree that there is a covenant. It is confirmed. It seems to be something on the table that's going to be made strong. It could be made strong through being imposed upon them, which I totally agree with you, John, on that. There's a possibility. And then you look at other scriptures. We know it's coming. Uh, Bill and I have contemplated, does it involve the building of the temple, possi possibly. So it could be that that is, is a major part of the agreement. Look, we'll let you do this as long as we have control and promise prosperity, ease, peace, and, security. And understand too, you know, the Saudis right now seem to be positioning themselves, even though they, you know, they condemn everything Israel does, they still want some kind of arrangement with this. Yes, they do. That, that's still on the table. They do. And one of the things yeah. that they started talking about two years ago was the stuff started coming out in the Saudi press, which doesn't happen unless the crown prince is going to approve it, that, you know, we don't really have a, a religious claim to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. They've said that. Now, they have a political, you know, Islam is very political, but so once Islam conquers someplace, they have it, but why were the Saudis saying, going along with guys like Dr. Mordecai Kadar, we should have him interview him sometime. And um, why, why were they saying, we don't really have a claim to Jerusalem religiously? That's kind of interesting. And, yeah. and you know, yeah. um, it's very political, the interest in that Temple Mount. And I've said, I don't know if you've seen this, this thing here, uh, this uh, Al-Haram Al Al-Sharif. Yes. Look, at, it was published by the WAF back in, 19, there's a couple versions. Yeah. This is the 1924 that, version that says 1924, yeah. that, the temp, that the Temple Mount 
uh, you know, it is the place of Solomon's temple cannot be questioned. Yeah. And now they run around and they say, well, they, no, 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 there were never any Jews here. And right. these aren't real Jews anyway. And, uh, it's, yeah, that is an it's interesting. A, it's John, you, can you, uh, people need to research that document. It is fascinating. I remember Bob Probert, who does my tours with me to Israel, also has a footsteps of Paul coming up with me in September, if y'all want to join us. It got blurry right there, John. Right there, it's perfect. There you so everybody, you need to check that out. It is fascinating. 1924, that one is dated, you said? Yeah, yeah. Al Haram Al Sharif. Yeah, it, it is get, this is a reprint that somebody sent me. I, I the last place I saw it, I think Randall Price through his uh, what's his what's his it? website, World of the Bible, or yeah. something like that. He has uh, it available. He he had it in his store. You you can find it out yeah. there. Just look for it's it. Worth, Al Haram Al Sharif, a brief guide, uh, and it's it's was produced by the WAF, the W A Q F. The walk the head the head of the Islam, Supreme Muslim Council in Israel. It's great. It's, it's under it, the Jordanian government now. Yeah, the Jordanian government. So there you go, nineteen twenty four. So a hundred years ago. It's By there. The, way, uh, the guy uh, who published this is the guy who went to Germany and talked to Hitler about the final solution. If to how to get rid so, of the Jews. Which right. even makes it more of a big deal because He's saying, we're going to kill the Jews. By the way, this is the Temple Mount because it's Temple Mount of the Jews. So there you go. Yeah, there's all kinds of pictures with him and Hitler, too. You can see him. By the way, while I'm thinking of it, I'm going to... Hey, you keep... Are, let me ask, is John fading out or is it my ears? Hello? I yeah, think it's, it's John. It's John? Okay, maybe get okay. closer to your mic. Okay, so um, now I forget what I was going to say. This, there's a guy out there, look him up, his name is Francisco Gil White, G-I-L-L-W-H-I-T-E, and he did a, a podcast with a guy, like two or three hours, where he talked about the history of Islam and the walk and Hitler. It's one of the most clear, unmistakable things, and he has a, uh, a, a substack I can't remember something about mapping of reality. Go ahead. I'm going to. We will get to your question just a minute about EMPs. I saw the question up there. So, okay, John, you back? Brenda, we'll get yeah. your question. I promise. Okay, John's okay, back. Okay, go ahead. Okay, there you go. Uh, maybe it just can't stand Sounds up better. to the uh, assault that I put on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking with too much. I'm punching my peas. That's funny. So, but uh, that is, I just want to tell you, everybody, that is absolutely fascinating to check that out. So, everything John just had, um, it's well worth looking at. Okay. Brenda Ogle says, Do you see anything wrong with planning or prepping for an EMP here in America? I, what I would say is, if you're not planning for it, you're making a mistake <laughs> because I, I think it's coming. Uh, you know, we, we have these, like these little events, like the, the bridge falling down in Baltimore, just not too many hours after the U S refuses to veto a anti-Israel resolution at the uh, security council. I think there's a definite connection there. Uh, you know, and look, I mean, we were sitting at home a couple of weeks ago and a storm blows through and some of the people around us didn't have power for 48 hours. So I think you need to, I think you need to be prepared for that. Uh, right. Now, fortunately we've been able to buy a generator. So we had power, uh, but we didn't have internet, which is, well, we did have internet because it didn't take down the cell tower. So we had cell phone internet. Yeah. So, okay. um, but yeah, I think you need to prepare. I, I just think you need to have some groceries put it up because I, I don't know that the Baltimore supply chain issue is going to be that, that big a deal. There are only about 10 ships in the Harbor. It's kind of a, a low time of shipping right now. And I think they'll be able to clear the Harbor entrance in about within a month. So things will be rerouted and stuff in the meantime. So I don't know that's going to have a big of an impact, but that's just one Harbor. You know, that's like the sixth largest one in the United States. What if they do something, in New York 
or New Jersey or Roanoke or someplace like that in places where I mean, a couple of our important naval ships, fast moving naval ships are in that harbor stock right now. But what happens if they do that with like Newport uh, or this? I don't know if they saw the sub base up at London, Connecticut. What if they do something up there to, because that's a river. I mean, what if they block that somehow? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a bridge over. I mean, I've been over the bridge on that. I used to do work with somebody in that, in that town. Yep. And, um, and I, I would think about that, like, there's the sub base and there's a bridge and, you know, so there's ways to, to dumb things up. If people are and asking, I'm going to cut in here, John, people are asking how they can get a hold of that document. What's the name of it again? We're going to put sure. it, we're going to put it in the, um, we'll put it in the, the, uh, description, everybody. So you can find it there. And also yeah, it's check called, out uh, a brief, store. a brief guide to Al Haram, A L hyphen H A R A M. Al Sharif A L hyphen S H A R I F Jerusalem, published by the Supreme Muslim Council, and it's about twenty pages, maybe. Well worth checking out. Sixteen pages. Yeah. Um, well worth checking out. Uh, yep. Back to the EMP. So I listen. Whether or not it's an EMP, I do not think it's a bad idea to be prepared for something, because the reality of it is. Um, we don't have enough electricity. The, the grid goes down. I mean, uh, as they put more and more people on electrical things, here in California, you're not allowed to have gas stoves anymore in new, in new construction. Insane. I know things like that are happening in New York, too. So you look at this more and more. We have more and more strain on the electrical grid. Folks, there's, there's a purpose for it. And I believe it's just a matter of time before things will be shut down. And then what do you do when you go? You can't get groceries for three days, which you and I have talked about before, John. Listen, just you need to be wise. We're not trying to scare everybody, but listen, if you're not prepared, you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt. So it's just be wise. Well, you need to be you need to be spiritually prepared because you know if the grid goes, if if there's an EMP, and it's it's countrywide, you know I I'm not, I don't want to scare anybody. This is true anywhere in the world, probably. But more so here, where we rely on grocery stores and you know pretty sophisticated shipping and supply chains, the EMP report that came out from the you know U.S. intelligence agencies a few years back, where ninety percent of U.S. is dead in ninety days. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's not looking good. People are not. I, look, prepared. I often joke. My brother's a marathon runner. Bless his heart. I, as you could tell, looking at me, I'm probably not a marathon runner. I was going to guess. That. I, I joke with him that, well, you know, there's two aspects to marathon training. There's the cardio and then there's the carbo loading. So I'm working on the carbo loading part, you know, and I'll get around to the running part eventually. Hey, what, what I remember, remember Yule Gibbons, he ate grape nuts and he still died. So, so, so did Jack, <laughs> Lil, so did Jack Lillane. So, so there. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, you could die happy. And, and so I'd like, so I, I do joke, but you know, I, I see all these people running around our neighborhood, you know, the, they've got the 26.2 or the 13.1 stickers on their bumper. And I'm like, well, when the famine comes, I'm going to come get all your stuff because I've got a famine ready body. I'm going to last a little while, <laughs> That's you know, at least I can go get your stuff. <laughs> there, there you <laughs> go. Left. But be prepared, especially spiritually, because, you know, we we have the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ and your neighbors are going to have a lot of questions. So be ready for that. Down for cooking says, do you think all the men crossing our borders are waiting for a green light to attack us? Uh, I don't think it's all of them, but I think it's a substantial number. It's a big number. It's insane. It, It makes no sense. And then they gaslight you all the time. Like you're, they tell you what you're seeing is not what you're seeing. Yeah. So I heard Biden, he was up there the other yesterday, gaslighting the world saying, I didn't have anything to do with this transgender day of visibility yeah. on resurrection Sunday. I don't know what, what you're are you talking, talking about? about. Yeah. Gaslighting gas- is off the charts. Yeah. And it, it happens everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, it is. It is. So yeah, when I look at these, what's happening on our borders, it's a, Folks, it's exceptionally bad, which is another reason to just be prepared. Something, listen, we, I, I, John, I think we all know something's going to happen. We can all sense it. Um, we got the EMP threats. We have border threats. We have 
digital currency threats, which I, at, at a 2 o'clock day with Kurt Reed, we're going to be getting into this whole thing that looks like it's coming in the next 12 to 24 months. So um, uh, uh, with digital currency, just be aware, in Australia right now, they are already enforcing this whole ID tracking. They're already, they're already enforcing it. So this stuff is coming, and we need to just need to be wise. We need to be really wise about how we go about things. Uh, and by you, the way, you were, in, you were in Scotland last year. I was in Scotland, and you know, driving around Scotland, there's cameras everywhere. Everywhere, you go. yeah. And they could there, track. I mean, I'm sure they could track everywhere I went last year when I was there. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're everywhere in, in uh, Australia. For all our friends in Australia, New Zealand, there's cameras everywhere. You are tracked. They'll send you a ticket if you're not wearing a seatbelt. Everybody's going the same speed. It's SWIFT, by the way, in this whole central bank digital currency that looks like it is coming mm -hmm. here, the United States of America, next 12, 24 months. So folks just need to be well prepared, be solid. Jesus said, see, I have told you these things beforehand. Not so we'd be scared, but so we would be prepared. So John is right. Listen, be wise, be prepared to not do something at this point. It's not, it's kind of, you know, just, just be wise, be wise. Uh, with that, uh, listen, Kurt will be joining me today at two. We'll be talking about the SWIFT program. You're Can I give you a, a piece of information? Yes. Our friend Roddy. Yeah. Um, he just sent me a text or WhatsApp. Hang on now. I, I've lost the, the thing. Uh, it says oh, there we it have is. the original. Harim we have the original of the Haram Al Sharif advertisement in oh. our Conrad Schick Library back at the museum. Next time I will show you. So, that is cool. So, have you been to that? He yet? has an original. No, I've not been there yet. No, no I've been there. Rod, Roddy's, thank you. Yeah, hey, send us both. I, I feel included, so that's good. That's so, right. uh, That's cool, Roddy. Thank you very much. Uh, and I can't Christ wait. Church in uh, in uh, the old city. In or in, yeah, in the, old city. in the old city. The museum there is off the charts. And if you want to see how everybody you hear about the temple being in the city of David, not being up on the Temple Mount, all you got to do is take a visit to the museum and you go, oh, wow, we know exactly where the temple was. But uh, there you have it right there at the, at the museum. The original, the original, that is totally cool. So if you're going to Jerusalem, like, I'll tell Brandon this. He's going in a couple weeks. And then Joe Pettick is too. I'll tell them they got to get by their, the museum. So, Roddy, I'll, I'll have them. I know you're busy. I'll see if they can connect with you. But um, this Sunday Olivier's morning. Olivier's going too. Pardon me? Olivier's going with them. Oh, that's right. Olivier is, isn't he? That's right. Totally cool. So, uh, this Sunday morning, I'll be continuing the Gospel of John. Looking forward to that. Bishop Alan Didio on Monday is going to be joining me. That's going to be totally off the charts. John, okay. You have any closing thoughts for everybody? You know, Tom, uh, I think I would appreciate people's prayers. I know you would as well, because those of us who feel called to do this, um, Sunday, I was exhausted. I mean, last week, I was just completely fried. Um, and uh, I got up Sunday morning. I'm like, I don't even know if I want to do an update today. I told PM on the way to church, I'm just, I'm tired. And um, so pray for the people that do this, one that will be discerning and that will have the energy because there's there's so much going up. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here with screen after screen after screen, sit down and look at stuff, start looking at the news and all of a sudden I'll look up and I'll have 87 tabs open in my browser. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. That's probably why my audio is going out because I have too much stuff open. So uh, just pray for us because it, it, that will be wise in the way we approach it. I don't, I don't want to be sensationalistic. Real life is sensationalistic enough right now without trying to enhance it. Amen. Let, let me, let me, pray I right think now. we're, we're going to see some really weird stuff yeah, we in the near to term. I think. Let, let, let me pray right now. Uh, Lord, sure. we thank you for this time together and we lift up our brother John to you. Continue to grant him wisdom and strength, persevering forward, that neither he nor I uh, would get too sensationalistic, wrapped up in those things, uh, but just stay focused on what your word does teach, the things that we do know, 
And Lord, we pray for everybody that's watching this. Strengthen them, watching now or watching later. Strengthen them uh, in your truth and in your word. We thank you for our brother Roddy in Jerusalem. Continue to watch over our friends there in Israel. Watch over your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, John. Looking forward to talking to you soon. Maybe one day, maybe one day I'll golf with you and Bill when you come out. Okay, that'd be great. Maybe I'll that'd do be it. Great. I, I will probably actually have fun, <laughs> so, even though I lose. So, all right. right. See everybody. Thanks.